Hello everyone, my name is Spencer Walsh. Welcome to today's show. We have a good one for you as always on today's News Flash episode. Wanted to do something a little bit different on today's show and go deep on a very interesting story that has been percolating. It is the situation in Aurora, Colorado where Venezuelan gangs, there was a big rumor going around, Donald Trump talked about it, Venezuelan gangs took over supposedly this apartment building and it was supposed to be the sign of the migrant crisis. There's also a related story about Haitians eating pets that's been circulating around that's a little bit more obviously fake. We'll give you the whole crazy details on all of that and the very fitting thing that this whole scam actually turned out to be and really what it says about just everyone in our politics in general. It's a very interesting story. Um, Also, we will be talking about the Trump-Harris debate and we're going to go into a New York Times story about some concerns. And oh my, I just literally just realized the debate is tomorrow. We may have to do a oh, Wednesday, I guess we'll do a, a show on that. We'll have a big debate preview for that. It's going to be very, very interesting. A lot of stuff going on when it comes to that. Also on the show today, an American... Uh, was killed in the West Bank. We will give you the White House's response to Joe Biden, the consoler in chief. We will tell you exactly what he said through a spokesperson to mark the moment. All right, so I do want to go into this today and kind of start here by playing a little bit from, you know, this essentially, it it really is a crazy, crazy situation. Um, The Aurora, Colorado, essentially, the the way the story goes is that it, a lot lot of it does stem from a video of the, this kind of very mysterious video that some people say, and it's not exactly confirmed that these are members of this Venezuelan gang, which I believe is called Trend de Arroyo or something like that. Um, they are, you know, they're a totally real gang. Like their, their founder was in prison and he took over the whole prison. He did a whole Pablo Escobar style situation. And he apparently, you know, like this, this may or may not have shown the actual gang members. Um, you know, it could have been just any men with guns, uh, not connected to it, but we don't really know the source of the video. That is essentially supposedly filmed by a scared resident. And we don't know what that exactly is is going on with um but these this starts to go around and then the mayor that we'll, we'll play a clip of it is from this kind of npr report here that's they uh, typed it up um but we'll play some of that in a second but it, it this the mayor of aurora colorado who's a republican goes on the local news and is essentially just like you know these people they're taking things over it's You know, I think he uses the direct verbiage, multiple apartments have fallen when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to this Venezuelan gang coming in and taking over. And then we have this video that was supposedly filmed by this this resident. So it's a very weird situation. Let's hear a little bit of this NPR report about like residents being evicted from their homes, you know, signs of people just heading out and, you know, not pay and the the one of the specific allegations that was made by the mayor was that it was extracted essentially the rent was being extracted by the Venezuelan gangs and the real property owners these good heart of property owners in the original selling of the Aurora Republican mayor mayor Kaufman um essentially says that this is going to be, you know, like the, the, these people have fallen. They have chased these people out through intimidation and the apartment buildings have now fallen is, is how he frames it. Um, let's take a listen here to it um, from the uh, NPR report. National headlines have described an armed Venezuelan gang taking over an apartment building in Colorado. These stories stem from a cryptic video that circulated widely in the news and on social media. Colorado Public Radio's Kyle Harris explains what happened. Last week, a video from the Denver suburb of Aurora was seemingly everywhere on social media and then started airing on TV stations. It showed men with guns in an Aurora apartment complex, allegedly filmed by a scared resident. We haven't been able to independently confirm the source of the video. But when Donald Trump talked about it on the Lex Fridman podcast... 
He said the facts are clear. You saw in Aurora, Colorado, um, a group of very tough young thugs from Venezuela taking over big areas, including buildings. They're taking over buildings. They have their big rifles. Shortly after the video appeared, Colorado's Republican Party sent a fundraising letter claiming the state is under violent attack and Venezuelan gangs have taken over Aurora. But what's actually true is far from clear. It is true that in the last two years, more than 40,000 Venezuelan immigrants have arrived in the Denver metro area. And it is true that many now live in Aurora. It's also true Aurora police have recently arrested 10 members of a Venezuelan gang called Train de Aragua. But Aurora's interim police chief, Heather Morris, says there's no evidence of a gang takeover of apartment buildings in her city. Her department recorded this video after she talked to residents of the allegedly gang-run apartment building. I'm not saying that there's not gang members that don't live in this community. But what we're learning out here is that gang members have not taken over this complex. So that is the interim police chief who probably is most incentivized to make up some kind of uh, big, you know, dramatic situation as police chiefs are known to do, who is coming out and essentially saying, yeah, there are, you know, like, we're not saying there aren't gang members here. You know, there's gang members everywhere. Kind of a very you know, police officer, kind of a crime is around every corner type of mindset. But she does explicitly come out and say that there are no gang members there at the uh, apartment. They haven't taken over the apartment building. Um, you know, we're saying the gang members have not taken over the complex is the direct quote. So that is essentially, to my mind, you know, disproves this situation. I think it's going to be very interesting to take a look at how this situation got up. And it, obviously, you know, you heard Trump talking about it, Elon Musk on Twitter talked about it a lot. And that's going to be circulating to quite a lot of people because um, he essentially archives or pu- pushes his tweets. I had to, you know, on on my Twitter account, I blocked him because it was just like, Every single moment of the day, you would be getting an Elon Musk tweet. You would be getting um, some sort of you know weird, corny joke that he made. It was just not good in any way. Uh, but what I heard <laughs> is he he was talking about this quite a lot, and it just was like you know it. it, it I think it's completely at this point is is completely um, vindicated. I guess to for lack of a better word, that the people who were saying that this was a a, a hoax situation um and this this situation here like i think it's we there needs to be i think now that we kind of understand this hoax i think the the denver police chief has come out and said something about this um and the, I think we'll delve more into the real background on exactly what's happening and why people are not paying their rent within the building um, in, in just a moment, but I think it, there really needs to be a you know an investigation, whether it be a journalist or someone else, maybe even like, like law enforcement about how this was able to get out and you know, really cause such a moral panic when it was so completely, completely untrue. I think it's definitely going to be something worth investigating. And I think the real remarkable story on this is not just you know we we heard from the interim police chief of Aurora, but let's hear from now, like the mayor of Aurora, who had a pretty remarkable journey on this as well. He goes from, no, this is him originally. Aurora, Colorado. Mayor, thank you very much for, for coming on with us. Um, it seems it's tough Pleasure to even me. get some confirmation of the details of what is going on there. First off, um, can you confirm whether or not this gang has taken over these buildings there in Aurora? So there are several buildings uh, actually under the same ownership, out of state ownership. Uh, that have uh, fallen to uh, these Venezuelan gangs. Uh, we're, I'm trying to walk it back and do the and do the, the investigation as to how the Vene- so there's a concentration of Venezuelans uh, uh, in these these three buildings. Uh, um, somebody put them there and somebody funded it. Uh, whether it's federal government or not, we're trying to find out who. Uh, the- so that was him originally on about. Uh, 10 days ago on August 30th and he essentially comes in and says that these have fallen you know we we don't know who put them there we don't know who funded it and that is his original kind of estimation on what he he says there which turns out to be you know completely untrue and he's come in and and walk it back later on because this kind of describes here and we can continue with the NPR report um, about exactly what happened with the apartment. 
once people actually showed up, you know, the interim police department, uh, the Aurora Police Department chief said what she had to say, um, and things turned out to be quite a bit different. Thank you so much for coming. At a press conference called by people who live in the building, called The Edge at Lowry, resident Moises Didenote said criminals don't live there at all. He says we're fathers of families, we're mothers of families, we're hard-working people. Didenote says it's the owner of the apartments who's the criminal here for taking their rent but not keeping the building habitable. Dozens of residents cheered as Didenote spoke. They say they have no fear of gang members or other criminals, other than vigilantes who are promising to bring guns to take back Aurora from Train de Aragua. Tenants walked reporters through apartments infested with rodents, bed bugs, and broken appliances. They say the company that manages them, CBZ Management, doesn't return their calls for repairs. In early August, CBZ emailed reporters a statement from a public relations firm alleging a, quote, violent takeover by Train de Aragua of multiple buildings the company owns. CBZ owners will not identify who in the company specifically alleged the gang takeover. They did not respond to our requests to speak on the record. Aurora's mayor, Republican Mike Kaufman, says he is concerned about crime at the apartments, but denies there's a gang takeover. And he calls the owners out-of-state slumlords. Immigrant rights advocate Jennifer Piper with the American Friends Service Committee thinks the apartment owners are alleging a gang takeover to shirk their responsibilities. All this stuff about Tren de Aragua is a great distraction from the systemic problems that exist around housing in the city of Aurora. Piper. So that is a really kind of remarkable situation. So you hear there first at the end, I want to point out Republican Mayor Mike Kaufman, who you just heard there talking in those very you know, dulcet, dramatic tones, you know, about the situation in Aurora. You know, he now has a he, he came out later and said that they are slumlords, that the, 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 the building is run by out of state slumlords and that it's not a gang takeover. I think we have we have out of state owners that are slumlords. I remember going there over a year ago uh, at the request of the residents that you know it, in looking at the habitability concerns of the building. Yeah, so that's he's talking about there the Aurora apartment. So saying that there are slumlords there in charge. But I think that, like the other thing is here they this CBZ management firm that is putting people in bad conditions they are not doing right by them in any real way shape or form they are coming in and saying um you know we're going we're going to try and scare you out with some sort of kind of property you know notice here like we're going to try and essentially hire this PR firm to exploit the migrant crisis in general, try and whip up a story, which they've done very effectively. And it has real, you know, because they're taking advantage of a moment here where you have in the broader political sphere, both sides really demonizing and acknowledging as a crisis and fear mongering about as a crisis, the higher amount of migrants and the you know reportedly high number of Venezuelans that have come over the border here. And the thing is, if you look down to, if you get down on the bottom of it, you know, these things are like the, the, the crime rate in Aurora has actually dropped 20 percent in confluence with a drop in crime rate already. Like the, the migrant crisis, the migrant crisis, so to speak, it plays such a little part in the issues that, you know, it actually plays a part in from housing to crime. And like if you take a look at every single time a migrant you know commits a crime, it's going to be amplified because people are pushing a political agenda, whether it be this. PR firm that's hired by this slumlord management company that knows it can take advantage of the political climate to actually get this story passed a lot of effectively, and they, you know, their court case that you know there have been local news reports about prior to this because the the buildings were almost condemned. Um, you know, like there's been local news reports prior to you know their situation, and the court date was actually pushed back because of all this panic about you know gangs supposedly taking things over in this building which all turned out to be completely completely ridiculous and now it has gone over and turned you know like it's this this has been used by you know it, on this on this small level this company to to be able to profit off of keeping people for their literal homes in awful un, indefensible ridiculous conditions 
that have been just used to, you know, they've been you, threats, you know, it, and not only is it, will we not, you know, you have no choice but to live in these bad conditions, but you can get kicked out of your home, you can get arrested, and you can get the incitement of right-wing vigilante violence, like, these people getting text messages from random numbers being like, you know, oh, my, my boy's coming up there with a bunch of guns on his motorcycle, he's gonna bring in a bunch of firepower, like, it, it's just an absolutely ridiculous situation that hate is being whipped up, but you also have migrants rights, migrant safety being exploited by pretty much every other part of the political spectrum. When you talk Donald Trump, you know, shamelessly using this, shamelessly, you know, distorting the situation. And again, as we talked about J.D. Vance today talking about this story that's been absolutely ridiculously disproven story already. It's like it's almost even too stupid to even bring up. Um, you know, and we're not going to go fully into like disproving it like this story because there was actually, you know, this video that apparently was part of a, a you know, random break in. But this narrative that was essentially fabricated by this PR company that this CBZ management hired here to distort the situation and to, again, not only keep these people in bad situations and protect themselves from the long arm of the law, but also threaten them with the threat of right-wing violence, with threat of getting kicked out of their homes, of getting arrested for being so-called, you know, Venezuelan gang members. A lot of these people are, you know, probably migrants themselves that are not, you know, big fans of the situation going on here at all and are incredibly intimidated by it. Um, so it is it is really, really telling. It is, again, and this is a symptom of a broader issue of essentially how we are seeing this manipulation of all sorts of you know the, uh, of, of migrant rights for for people's political aims they're the political football they're the thing that's you know people are standing on to get what they want whether it be Kamala Harris trying to get some you know border respect get you know the attention off of her worst issue she is being incredibly you know she's her policy positions that actually came out today um, are pretty vague about this but her rhetoric in her you know ads showing the border wall they have not been pretty vague she's trying to go on a hard right border message you know again trump using this to continue to whip up hate he's the origin of all this but kamala harris i think does pay, play a big role in terms of you know in in service of getting to her own political ambitions she very effectively makes this acceptable makes this more widespread and then you know like the far right and stuff is just you know taking this up and then you know People like landlords are taking advantage of migrants for their aims of profit, and it really is a horrific situation. But again, as more stuff is coming out about this, I think you know it's important to cover this because you're never really going to hear the follow up story um, before you know you, until it's until it's really too late. So it's important to get you know. I'm sure maybe you have if you're a younger listener, you have an older relative that sent you this or texted you about this, like. It is a completely BS story. So um, this is actually in the, in the the New York Post. A Chicago landlord, or sorry, Colorado landlord has agreed to sell a troubled apartment complex that was taken over. Again, completely false. It was published yesterday. That's that's the New York Post there for you. Zev Baum, Baumgartner um, Garten has been fighting with a Denver suburb of Aurora over the Aspen Grove. Uh, apartment complex out of the city accused him of allowing it to becoming a trash ridden gang infested hellhole, according to records obtained by the Denver Gazette. So again, even they're they're trying to spin it off here as even though you know the gangs have not been the residents are holding press conferences to say the gangs haven't taken over. The police chief and the mayor now say gangs have not taken over. It's run by the slumlord. Now he's trying to it's essentially spin it for the slumlord bringing you know allowing the gangs to come in which the gangs haven't even happened which you know again it's, it's pretty ridiculous here um you know all this uh, all this pressure and the fact that you know the, the the jig is up on what was as at least as i understand it's a pretty complicated situation as i understand it was a ongoing court case um you know the jig is up on that so now you are uh essentially getting the you know, you, you, the 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 bill has come due, and you have to sell the place. Um, so that is the the long and short of it, and it's, it's just another really really egregious example of the takeover of this this situation. And when there's no alternative argument made about you know why migrants are good, you know how they are by and large much more contributive to society in every way that you could possibly name. Than the average citizen. I mean, I guess I wouldn't say I don't. You know, I don't want to devalue the average citizen, but it's like, you know, these people are definitely not drains on the society. I can make that case 
all day long. And so I think it's very telling that you have this migrants, you know, migrants rights, fears over migrants being just blatantly used as a political tool to for, you know, in service of profit of uh, people like landlords in service of you know, the profit of political candidates like Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. So definitely something to watch out for. And again, this also this ridiculous Haitian dog story. Like, come on. Uh, in Springfield, Ohio, like, go look that up if you want to just really, you know, blow your brains out if you care about immigrant rights at all. And it, again, I think a lot of part of this is because we don't have someone making the alternative argument. It's a very big thing. All right. Much more to do. We are moving on to our next story. Uh, after weeks of Democratic exuberance surrounding Vice President Kamala Harris's sunrise to presidential nomination, this will be here, by the way, in the New York Times, as a brace for another nail biter against former President Donald J. Trump, asked what should be keeping Democrats up at night, Patrick Murray, who directs the polling institute at Monmouth University, replied bluntly, they could lose. That outcome seemed a near guarantee before President Biden bowed out of his re-election bid this summer, Matt Murray said. Uh, now, he said, you are the election is merely a close race as opposed to a race that you're almost certain to lose. A poll of v- likely voters by the New York Times and Siena College found Trump leading Harris 47, 48 to 47 within the poll's three percentage point margin of error. I forget ex- exactly what the last one was. I think it was he was drawing in a little bit closer. I think it was like maybe two or three points. Trump was up over Harris, but and now this is one, but still not we want to be, especially as a Democrat with the popular vote, kind of electoral college disadvantage there. On the eve of the only scheduled debate between Harris and Trump, here's a look at some of the main worries emerging for Democrats, according to some New York Times reporting and analysis. Before Biden dropped out, he appeared stunningly weak among vital groups of democratically in voters, including black, Hispanic, and younger Americans. I think that big part of that is because, A, he's old, he offers no change, he's nothing new. And then I think that this is these are the three demographics where um, Gaza would hurt Joe Biden the most. So polls have shown Harris make him ground with some of those voters in a Gallup survey released last month captured a significant surge in Democratic enthusiasm. But leading Democrats caution that expressing excitement in a poll is not the same as delivering a vote. That enthusiasm is real, said Senator Tina Smith of Minnesota, the vice chair of the Democratic Senate campaign arm. We now have to turn that energy into support for our candidates. What keeps me awake right now, she said, is just complacency, that people sort of ride the wave of that energy without buckling down and getting the work done at the grassroots. While Harris has improved on Biden's standing with some of the core Democratic-leaning groups, she still sells short of traditional Democratic strength in the times Siena poll. Notably, she was a choice of 55% of Hispanic voters in the matchup, um, similar to Biden's 52% showing in June. Not really good. Uh, and this is, again, down from 65% of Hispanic voters in 2020, which was a really bad year uh, traditionally for Democrats with Hispanic voters. Some Democrats, have, some, some Democrats have also worried about whether black men in particular could be more receptive to Trump this year. And again, the bottom line is all of these things are going to be very important to to highlight and keep an eye on here. Uh, some of the, you know, the biggest election worries, if you're a Democrat and you like to worry, this is you know the segment for you. Um, Representative Susan Del Ben, Bene, a Washington Democrat who is the chair of the House Democratic campaign arm, said in an interview, the enthusiasm absolutely does translate into votes when people are not just feeling energetic, but actually showing up to help make sure they're working to get out the vote. Uh, another big question here is Pennsylvania, and this is where we get the Josh Shapiro discourse, which I'm not personally a big fan of. I think you know you never know what could happen. I think the the, the stuff about the murderings, you know, a woman would have hurt him a lot. You know, helping cover up murder a woman, um, you know, I think that would have hurt him a lot in a lot of other places. You know, let alone probably hurt him in Pennsylvania as well. Um, so the Times polling average shows that the race in Pennsylvania is essentially tied with Harris up by a point. Um, with a large population of residents who do not have college degrees, a constituency that's increasingly favored Republicans and Biden as great narrative uh, native, sorry, no longer on the ticket. Democrats in the state are ex- expect a exceedingly close race. So again, Biden, the pretty, pretty much the only place where he made gains in 2020 was among white men cutting in a little bit with that kind of Scranton Joe middle class persona. He cut in actually a little bit into that uh, white working class, chill, cool dude vibe. And I think that is very, very important when you get to, you know, what is really, you know, the bottom line on this, which is that, you know, 
he needs to Kamala Harris needs to find some way to either you know claw back some of that white support, even though he doesn't she doesn't have that Scranton Joe narrative to her, or you know replace that support, drive up turnout, you know somewhere else. And I think there's a lot of places. The the big reason why she's doing so much better is because she has clawed back that support, that interest from those three big kind of young left wing groups, the you know Hispanic voters, Black voters, and young people in general. Um, Brendan Boyle, a Pennsylvania Democrat, said that was the case when Joe Biden was the Democratic nominee in terms of uh, Biden overperforming performing in Pennsylvania. And I still think it's the case with Kamala Harris as the nominee. Before Biden's disastrous June debate performance, the race had appeared close in the state. Biden in 2020 said he over uh, Boyle said here dra- he dramatically overperformed in northeastern Pennsylvania, an area that typifies the type of working class historically Democratic territory where Trump has come to have strong support. And you can see where that's where he does a lot of his rallies there in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, around Erie County area is a big kind of swing state area in that state. Um, so Boyle also noted the flip on the education side. Uh, but it's also a lot of people, Democrats, kind of get the vibe that Trump seems to be flailing here. Why is the race so clo- close? He's trailing Harris in fundraising, struggled to drive a consistent message against her, floundered against another news cycle about abortion rights. His campaign clashed with the army over the Arlington Cemetery. Nobody cares about that. Um, and, you know, he went out of his way last week to remind the country that he faces accusations of sexual misconduct from multiple women. I don't, again, I, unfortunately, I don't think many people are going to be weighing that too heavily. I think it's uh, crazily enough, it's priced in with Donald Trump in the voting booth. Um, so some Democrats also said they expected Trump to ultimately find effective attack lines, always a safe assumption. Um, the Carrier's campaign has argued she is the underdog and will run the kind of aggressive race that such a position would require, trying to hype up that battleground state infrastructure. But the debate will be the biggest test yet of whether Harris can cut into Trump's enduring advantages as she continues to introduce herself as a clo- into a closely divided country. I think bottom line is a lot of people have checked out. It's going to be very hard for her to kind of flip that gap. Even though, you know, as much as she may try. And I don't think, though, it's necessarily going to be completely bad for her chances either. Let's go now to our final story. This is from the West Bank, where we had the uh, American citizen who was killed by Israel who was protesting. Um, I'm going to definitely butcher her, her name. It's like Isonur uh, Egi or Engi. Um, Again, definitely butchering that name here. But Biden, again, A, he's the consultant in chief. B, he's somebody who is always trying to hype himself up. He's trying to, um, you know, flex American power, saying, if an America is harmed, we will respond. You know, this is a quote that I see for Biden passed around a lot. And check out this response here uh, from John Kirby uh, to end the show when he is asked about this. This killing, again, cold blooded sniper shot. To the head, no doubt, really, on the intention to kill. The American citizen who was killed in the West Bank on Friday, uh, Aysen Arege, has the president had a chance to speak to her family at all? Um, and do you have any sense of uh, where the investigation stands? I know that you all had asked. This investigation, um, mythical so investigation. Well, an investigation to her death. Do you know uh, if there are any updates on that? He has not spoken to the family uh, as of yet. I don't have a, a call to, to, uh, to talk about uh, today. Obviously, we continue to. Uh, mourn with uh, with her family, of course. Um, the Israelis have uh, reached out, made sure that we knew that they uh, were promptly investigating this. Um, as I understand it from just before I came out here, they are moving swiftly on this investigation and will soon, we think, uh, in coming days, be able to present their, their findings and conclusions. We'll obviously hold our judgment until we see that. We've called for a complete, thorough, swift, and transparent investigation. We'll, we'll see We'll see what they learn. Okay. So, again, I think there's a lot of things to note there. Again, by not calling objectively insane. Like, that is the president, this American citizen who's been shot in a foreign country, and you don't, you know, what other circumstance would that happen? What other country would that be the case with? And I think that's what you do, the special treatment of Israel is such a common theme in U.S. diplomacy. So it's going to be interesting to see, A, if Israel offers something legitimate up in the investigation for them to kind of wrap their their arms around and condemn and say, okay, you know, enough has been done. Uh, but 
it very, very well couldn't be that they just say, you know what, we killed her, what are you going to do about it? And that'll be very interesting to see how Joe Biden responds, but still a pretty shocking abdication by Joe Biden and a belying of the fact, his, his commoner feign of, oh, there's going to be no uh, you know time where an American is harmed where we don't respond. That has p- completely been proven wrong, uh, really to the detriment of are people as a whole and it's going to be interesting to see what they do when this so-called classic israeli investigation that should be a trademark there uh comes out all right so we got for you guys today back on wednesday the two slash